it was, of course, a very special uh, Finance Commission report in the sense of the current um, uh, COVID times. So it was a very, very difficult task. Um, and of course, uh, Mr. N.K. Singh uh, chaired it. So um, we are going to, given that it's a very complex report with lots of issues in it, uh, even though we will be doing a three-part series, uh, we would still just be touching on the periphery of the report. So uh, today is the sort of overall architecture of the report, overall view of the report, uh, as presented by Mr. N.K. Singh. Uh, the second one will be next week, same time, uh, same place, uh, 15th of uh, March. Uh, that'll be on fiscal federalism and human capital. Uh, the moderator will be Mr. Montek Singh Alwalia. Uh, the speaker will be Mr. Anup Singh. And the discussants will be uh, Yamani Ayer and Prachi Mishra. Um, the third one will be in the sec 22nd. That is ex again the same time on Monday, 22nd. Uh, the speaker is um, uh, Pranab Sen. The moderator will be Mr. Anup Singh. And the commentators will be uh, uh, Sajid Chinoy uh, and uh, Mr. Tumbe. Uh, now, uh, let me, uh, I won't take much time, uh, but I do want to introduce the uh, speakers. Uh, Mr. N.K. Singh, of course, so as I mentioned, the chairman of the Fiscal Finance Commission. He also served uh, as chairman of the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Review Committee, and of course, a member of parliament. Prior to those engagement, uh, N.K. had an absolutely distinguished career as a member of the IAS. Uh, and included positions in the Ministry of Finance as Secretary uh, Revenue uh, and as Expenditure Secretary, and then uh, Secretary of the Prime Minister Vajpai. Um, he was also, of course, closely involved with the 91 uh, policy reforms uh, right through the 1990s and was among the principal interlocutors in negotiations uh, with the World Bank and the IMF during that time. Um, I should also mention uh, that he's recently released his absorbing autobiography. If I, with NK's permission, I can exhibit it, Portraits of Power. Uh, and the title itself illustrates his career being near the center of policymaking uh, with, uh, for almost 30 years. Um, so that I don't uh, disrupt the discussion in the middle, let me also introduce our two discussants. Um, the uh, first uh, discussant uh, is uh, Dr. Shankar Acharya. Um, he has served uh, as a member of the 12th Finance Commission uh, he also was a member of Securities and Exchange Board of India and of the National Security Advisory Board, among other positions. His last position was non-executive chairman of Kotak Mahindra Bank for the, its first 12 years of existence. Um, and its uh, success, I think, owes a great deal to his, uh, as always, uh, amazing chairmanship. Um, he was Chief Economic Advisor of the Government of India, for the Ministry of Finance from 1993 to 2000. I think the longest tenure of any chief economic advisor uh, record is probably will remain unbroken for a long time to come. Um, and of course, he has a range of publications on macroeconomic policy, growth, international economics, and public finance. Uh, from my just personal point of view, he's undoubtedly the foremost, most balanced, and respected commentator on macroeconomic issues in India. So we're very lucky to have his sage-like views today. Um, the third uh, discussion is uh, Mr. Anup Singh. Uh, he's currently a distinguished fellow at CSEP and was a member of the 15th Finance Commission. Uh, he had a long career uh, at the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, where his appointments included um, being director of the Asia Pacific Department, which covers all of Asia, and the Western Hemisphere, which covers all of Americas. Um, he's also been special advisor to the Governor Reserve Bank of India sometime back. Uh, he also taught at Georgetown University at Washington, D.C. as an adjunct professor and has worked uh, extensively and written extensively on macroeconomic surveillance and crisis management issues. As director of the two departments uh, uh, in the IMF and throughout his career at the IMF, he was among the key trouble scooters for almost 30 years of the IMF and was instrumental in bringing macroeconomic stability and fiscal discipline in a host of countries and is known for his hard driving uh, pressure on countries to reform when they get into crises. So I think the Finance Commission was lucky to have him and we are certainly uh, lucky to have him. So uh, NK, uh, may I uh, uh, request you to give your opening address? Um, and if I may, if I'll just put some 
few broad questions which you may or may not include in your address. First, uh, what are the key challenges that uh, you had the Finance Commission during this particularly difficult times? Um, and in the light of many subsequent developments, um, one question is, has the role of the Finance Commission somehow got muted by, by, by ongoing developments? Uh, for instance, uh, I find your, uh, I found that the, the, your uh, conclusion that the Indian tax GDP ratio is about 5% lower than what it should be is really striking and that it has been rock solid for a decade. So that really leaves very little wiggle room for both horizontal and vertical distribution. So I assume that is among the key challenges that we had. Also, of course, the key challenges of Indian federalism, how has it actually worked in practice? And do we need constitutional other changes? Um, on fiscal issues, uh, how do you see the emerging scenario on the symmetry between the center and the states? Um, the, um, I'll leave it there and maybe ask you some more questions uh, later. Uh, but of course, you're free to speak as you, to give us a broad overview and the key findings and issues that you addressed in the Finance Commission report. Thank you, uh, NK. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rakesh. First and foremost, my profound gratitude to your organization, now the CSEP under your distinguished uh, leadership as the president of this organization, which has taken off from already very credible start, uh, given the fact that you have been able to, in a short period of time, galvanize some of the best minds to deliberate on issues which represent some of our important contemporary challenges. Also, Rakesh, my gratitude for having convened this three-part interaction through a webinar, which I'm sure would be enhance the degree of understanding of the challenges and also the opportunities grasped and the opportunities missed by an unusual 15th Finance Commission, which we chose to call uh, a Finance Commission in COVID times. And unusual also because um, unlike most Finance Commissions with the exception of one, we have given an award for six years. For the first year we have given for the year 2021 and thereafter, the report which we submitted represents five years uh, from 21 to 26, which means that the next award will only begin to kick in in the year 27. So as you pointed out, you have raised some very pertinent issues, which I will try to very briefly touch upon. Uh, I intend to, since you have uh, separate sessions on the fiscal issues uh, directly, I'd like to take this opportunity with your permission to speak on some of the more general issues on the issues of the center state relations, more importantly, the, the evolution of India's federalism. So as we know that India is a union of states uh, and not a confederation of states. It's a union which is indestructible, although the states are destructible and can change their contours. It has a written constitution which sets out this federation model. There are division of powers. Uh, the, this each state has a separate legislature. It has a separate judiciary, the high court. And we really function in a bicameral framework. Uh, many states do not have, of course, the upper house, but quite a few states continue to have their upper house. Some abolished it, but then revived it. But as, as far as the central government is concerned, the both the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha are permanent features of our legislative framework. I think that the origins of the India's evolution of federalism owes its origin to the Government of India Act of 1919, which uh, broadly laid down the revenue heads between the center and the states. This was an important thing. And then it was given a more tangible content in the Government of India Act of 1935, which talked of the sharing of centers resources for the first time, and also mentioned for the first time, the entire issue of what is known as a grants and, grants and aid to by, given by the Consolidated Fund of India as a charge on the Consolidated Fund of India for helping the states. Now this provides therefore the basic federal structure of the union. So within this framework, as we go forward, there are five complex issues 
which we need to navigate. First, in the division of functions between the center and the states, this function, as we all know, is laid out in the seventh schedule of the constitution, which uh, lays down what the obligations of the center, what are the obligations of the state, and what are those in the concurrent list. Over a period of time, the concurrent list has got somewhat enlarged. For instance, by the 42nd constitutional amendment, forest and education got included in the concurrent list. In addition, parliament has enacted standalone legislations in the area of food, the Food Security Act, the area of employment, the Monrega Act, in the area of education, the Right to Free Education Act, and these standalone legislations, to some extent, also have a bearing on the working of what was originally designed to be the seventh schedule demarcating the functions between the center and the states. So to some extent, this has been further complicated by the use of, the word, by the use of Article 282 of the Constitution, under which, now currently I took the reckoning, there are 211 centrally sponsored schemes arranged under 29 umbrella schemes. Many of these are in areas which are in the domain of the states. As we go forward, I think that it is fundamental to the functioning of India's federal policy that we review the working of the seventh schedule in the light of the changing patterns of government in the light of the fact that the government has become increasingly more and more presidential and less and less Westminster model. This is so in the center and the states. And in a certain sense, therefore, that has a huge bearing and impinges on the ways in which the Article 282 of the Constitution can be read with the seventh schedule. I have therefore believed that we need fundamentally go back to the drawing board and look at what is a kind of a seven schedule which will be relevant looking at today's contemporary challenges, electoral expectations, and the nature of the governance rubric. There's a second important challenge. The third important challenge, as at first I told you the seven schedule. The second, as I mentioned, the review of Article 282 of the Constitution. The third important challenge is in what way do we fully factor in the 73rd and the 74th constitutional amendment? These, of course, as you know, led to the creation of the third tier, the urban local bodies and the panchayat institutions expected to have independent functions in terms of functions, functionaries and finance, all the three being assigned. Now, as we look at our past experience, all that the constitution provides is that the Finance Commission of India, each finance commission will make recommendations on how to augment the consolidated fund of the state based on the recommendations of the state finance commission to be able to assign finances for the working of the third tier. In practice, this has not happened. State finance commissions have not been set up, or if they have been set up, there has been total lack of alacrity in following up the recommendations or wherever the recommendations have been followed up. These have not been laid in the legislature. In short, the entire area of the State Finance Commission is mired in uncertainty. In the light of this, should the Finance Commission continue to assign large resources to the third tier? We have, in order to obviate uncertainties, and lack of predictability, put the states on notice, but we have not only assigned, we have substantially increased the amount of devolution to the third tier from what was given by the 14th Finance Commission. We have done so within the framework of certain obligations which are cast. But is this a satisfactory arrangement? Shouldn't the states be expected to live up to what the constitution expects them to live up, namely reactivate their state finance commissions. That's a, another important area, working as we go forward of the 73rd and the 74th constitutional amendment. The fourth important area 
which I want to focus on, is the working of the GST Council. As we know, part 12 of the constitution assigns powers of taxation and assigns responsibilities on taxation to the states. However, the constitutional amendment which came about has really to a very large extent subsumed a lot of these taxation powers and the autonomy of the states in regard to their own sources of revenue within the uh, an overall fabric of the, of the PST, which is to be shared within the center and the states. Now, whereas it is true that the GST council has the representatives of the state, the finance ministers of each of the states, or sometimes the chief minister are members of this GST council. The fact remains that wherever we have gone, all the states, or several of the states certainly, have mentioned to the finance commission that our flexibility in regard to taxation has now been subsumed in the GST council. And while conceding that their finance minister is a member, feel that one member is inadequate to be able to deflect the decision in one area or the other. Complicated with this is to address another question which you specifically asked me, the new challenges of the Finance Commission. One challenge, of course, is the relationship between the GST Council and the Finance Commission. The GST Council is responsible for all indirect taxation in a complete kind of way. The Finance Commission, when it does its calculations, are, is also concerned in a very substantial manner to projecting state finances, state by state, before based on normative kind of parameters which we introduced. We fix what is known as the revenue deficit grants for the state. So the working of the Finance Commission is integrally related to the decision and the decision-making process of the GST Council. The Finance Commission of the body is much older, it was created in 1949 as an interim finance commission. From 49 to 52, it worked, worked as the interim one under C.D. Deshmukh. Since then, we have been a continuing legacy of which the 15th finance commission I have been privileged to chair. But as we go forward, what we must work out a working relationship between the finance commission and the GST council both these have their own domain and both these are constitutional entities. So to some extent, that is an important challenge. Last one, which I will mention before I address your questions very sharply, are the issues, fiscal related issues. As I can see on fiscal related issues over the period of time, there are two big issues which remain unresolved. Apart from this issue of what kind of a consolidated fiscal roadmap or a debt trajectory would be appropriate for a country given India's per capita income and so on. Apart from addressing those holistic issues, two issues continue to be dominant. One, the lack of fiscal institutions in India, whether it be by way of fiscal council and what it would be by any other institution. The fact that we are one of those countries which apart from which while having some kind of a fiscal architecture does not have independent fiscal institutions is a factor that needs to be kept in view. And incidentally, since the world in general, investors, rating agencies and others focus not on the fiscal or the debt trajectory of the central government alone, but of the general government, which includes the central government, and the states will need to have an institutional framework which would cover both these as important partners. So this is one aspect I'd like to mention. One final aspect, asymmetry of powers between the center and the states. What is this asymmetry of power? As far as the central government is concerned, clearly they, while accepting the fiscal roadmap, they often, on account of very good reasons, exigencies of circumstances, have to take recourse to escape clauses and trigger the escape clauses. And then they take the parliament's approval for deviation from the fiscal roadmap. But nonetheless, 
there is a built-in latitude, which and for understandable reasons the central government has in seeking higher recourse to market borrowings under the exceptional circumstances. Without going to the merits of this, no such similar arrangement or device is available to the states. Each of the states, which we know, after the amendments which they introduced, are governed by their own Fiscal Responsibility Act. And the last Fiscal Responsibility Act, which the states had undertaken, was of course quite some time ago. And among other things, they will have to rework that out in the light of the 2018 recommendations accepted by government in their finance, in their finance bill. But the earth symmetry comes from Article 293 of the Constitution, namely what? That they will need the permission of the central government to contract any market borrowings. Now, this is quite understandable because after all, the overall macro stability of the general government is the obligation under the constitution of the central government alone. But nonetheless, in practice, the asymmetry in the recourse which the central government can take to additional flexibility in, the, in its fiscal apparatus is not available as recourse ordinarily to the states. We need to therefore see that as we look to a newer framework, apart from fiscal institutions, which you need to apply to both the center and the states, we would need to see that given today's circumstances, what kind of symmetry can be brought about. We have in some ways sought in our recommendations to mitigate this by giving a fiscal range instead of a fixed fiscal point, by permitting the states an extra one percentage point from whatever they took on as obligations under the state level FRBM, looking at the current pandemic, and then allowed them also recourse to half percent point of GDP in the event of their accepting certain important conditions in the reform of the power sector. But we need to formalize this arrangement as we go forward, not this recommendations which we have said, because these have been accepted with the central government, but the general principle of fiscal institutions and the general issue of the asymmetry in the powers as we look at a long-term arrangement on the fiscal consolidation roadmap. So I have outlined very briefly some of these important challenges which go beyond the fiscal issues which relate to federalism in general. And then I need to therefore address in one minute the three questions which you posed. The first question is the key challenges which we faced. The first critical challenge which we faced, which you all know, is the pandemic itself. It came bang when we were beginning to look at the Finance Commission's recommendations and what it, it needed to do for us to go back to the drawing board on some of the key parameters which we had assumed, inject a degree of uncertainty and inject the lack of predictability as we began to project a five-year trajectory on growth, on taxation, and availability of resources. The second challenge which we faced was that for, for the first time after 40 years, this, the census data, which this commission was asked to use, was the figure of 2011 population. And this led to high degree of fears and suspicions of many states which had performed very well on the demographic front, or whether the use of the 2011 census data would impair what they were legitimately expecting as devolutions to the Finance Commission. That was a challenge. We sought to balance this by introducing changes in the horizontal formula itself, by injecting two components, namely demographic management, and rewarding them by assigning a 12 and a half percentage weightage for improved demography, and second, in terms of rewarding them for tax efforts. So in the horizontal formula, the challenge of balancing between three components, which we need, represented by population, geographical area, and forest cover, between equity, by assigning the weight on per capita income, by some reckoning not high enough, but in our view, reasonable enough for 45%, 
and third, of recognizing and rewarding efficiency in terms of demographic management and on tax efforts. That was what the horizontal formula was. The issue of whether or not we had a latitude to go up or down on the 41%, we must recognize that on that issue, all past finance commissions had made incremental changes. So for a long time, you remember the divisible pools ingredients were also very different. Before 2000, the ingredients did not include all taxation. After the constitutional, 80th constitutional amendment introduced in 2000, the divisible pools definitions changed to all taxes, which included corporate tax, customs duty, and everything. But it kept the issue of cess and surcharge out. So that really is another debatable issue on what needs to be done by this way of cess and surcharge. That's not a subject in the domain of the Finance Commission. But sure enough, considering the fact that from the GRR, the gross revenue receipt of five years, which we calculated to be 153 lakh crores, to what was known as GTR, the gross tax revenue, which then came down to 134 lakh crores, if you take out cess surcharge and cost of collection, the divisible pool came to only 103 lakh crores, which is what we looked at from the GTR, the, the gross tax. As we go forward, this these will be one other important challenge. The 41% issue, as I told you, that each finance commission had made an incremental upward movement, excepting the 14th finance commission, which had placed it at 42%, which we felt in the interest of predictability, continuity, and eliminating uncertainty, we kept it at that level just taking out 1% on account of the creation of Jammu and Kashmir into two union territories. So we have kept consistency, predictability, and stability in doing that. We had the options of recalibrating it down. Partly the union government would have expected that. We had the option of increasing it in the upward direction, which was an important demand almost by all state governments but in the interest of predictability and stability, we've left it at the figure of 41 or 42 percent, which had been left by the 14th Finance Commission. Then, finally, this was a complex commission, Rakesh. The president had chosen to assign a terms of reference, which in many ways covered a much wider spectrum of issues than any other finance commission by way of monitorable fiscal monitorable performance criteria. And we were expected to give our opinion which issues on which we have also addressed in our recommendations. The final feature, if I may mention, unlike any commission in the past, having examined the state's finances in some depth, as also the finances of each of the key ministries of the union government, we decided to have the report in four volumes. First volume, which contains the main report. The second volume, which is the characteristic statistical companion. Volume three, entirely devoted to the union, namely the key union ministries on which we have suggested some illustrative reform program and the guidelines for further changes. And a volume four, entirely devoted to the states. Each of the states have been subjected to very critical and in-depth financial analysis, and we have given a roadmap for the economic development process of each of the states, which are therefore differentiated in multiple ways. It is from this that we came with also a differentiated debt and a fiscal trajectory for each of the states, which are around the overall figures, but we have given each of the states the kind of uh, analysis which uh, they certainly deserve and which is certainly expected. So uh, these were the kind of special challenges which you faced. One last word, you have mentioned that the tax to GDP ratio from the potential is certainly less than, uh, at least less than 5% of uh, GDP than what it could be. Yes, we were acutely conscious of this. And yes, we were acutely conscious as you say that this made the available resources a rather shrunken one, 
with on which we had to do the exercise of the divisible between the union and the states and among the states. And this is an issue which we have dealt with rather extensively in a chapter designed to resources. That chapter on resources addresses the issue of the far-reaching changes which you have suggested, not merely on processes and procedures or an improvement of the technology platform, but on the architecture of the GST itself, namely the entire issue of inverted duty structure, broadbanding of rates, elimination of exemptions, and of making it really a simple tax for all stakeholders who are participating, who are participants in this GST exercise. So we have given a framework for GST changes. We have given a framework on the direct taxes. And we hope that this, these recommendations in a separate chapter on resources will receive some consideration. Finally, one more word, one more unique thing which we did. Our chapter on disaster management perhaps is the most holistic chapter so far. It addresses for the first time some issues which had been left out, like issues of mitigation, like issues of capacity building, and like a more optimum sharing of the burden of the center and the states. And the chapter on disaster management, we have calibrated based on the best international practices and based on a lot of inputs which we had received for people who are domain experts in the area of disaster management. On the third tier, I will make some of my observations, perhaps in the Q&A session. But thank you very much, finally, for this opportunity. I've laid out the broad framework for what we have recommended, laid out the framework of uh, federalism, beyond fiscal federalism, and some of the issues which we need to deal with, deliberate, and arrive at a consensus as you go forward. Thank you very much, Rakesh. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, NK, for this, uh, if I may say, so masterful and eloquent and succinct summary of a very complex report. I know how difficult that is to do. So um, thank you very much indeed for uh, doing this so well. Uh, and something that, that, that is very, very, uh, very understandable, I think, by any informed observer. So thank you. Uh, before I uh, ask uh, Shankar Acharya to make his intervention, just an announcement that uh, for the Q&A, uh, just please pose your questions through the Q&A tab in the Zoom uh, dashboard. Um, so, and, and then we will come to that at the end of the interventions. So uh, Shankar, uh, let me now uh, just uh, ask you uh, once again, to give you a few prompts. Of course, you're free to uh, say, whatever you like in response to NK's presentation and otherwise. Um, but uh, the first question is somewhat one that is common what I asked NK, which is to do with the stagnation in the tax GDP ratio. And uh, connected with that, uh, the, that, given that the tax GDP ratio uh, has not been buoyant, and also there seems to be very little indication of buoyancy in the coming years, uh, how uh, that uh, affects the how that has made the tax devolution issue more difficult uh, with the increasing tax devolution from the center to the states um, uh, uh, since in the, in the last many, many commissions. Um, and uh, so what is a viable solution to this massive, and then of course that has led to the massive increase in cesses and surcharges, which also NK just uh, referred to. And the number he gave, I think if I, if I remember correctly, it means almost like a 25 to 30 percent reduction uh, in the divisible pool from the actual tax revenues of the center. Uh, second, uh, we really welcome the, again, uh, NK mentioned towards the end, um, the recommendations on simplifying the GST and the need for reform GST, uh, both for restoring the tax GDP ratio of center and the states. Uh, so uh, the question is, um, you know, uh, how is that, how serious is the problem with the mentioned, the states complaining about not having enough flexibility now because of the GST and not having enough power over their own uh, revenues. And how is therefore, how is the introduction of GST affected the task of the finance commissions? And finally, third, um, this issue again, which NK referred to is the increase in grants to local governments. 
and that has remained in some sense the Achilles heel of the Indian fiscal system, that we have just from our, from some work that we have done at CSEP, uh, it remains just about the lowest, uh, uh, if, you, if you take third tier tax GDP ratio, is among the lowest in uh, among even even among emerging market countries. Um, so your comments on that. Thank you, Rakesh. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, to this panel and for your very, uh, um, may I say, friendly introduction, especially of your last sentence description of me as a balanced commentator on Indian economic affairs. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I must get my weighing balance in order. Um, and uh, I would also say that uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity uh, in a way to um, uh, kind of um, interact and interrogate uh, the chairman of the 15th Finance Commission, an old friend, uh, NK, and another old friend um, and a distinguished member of the commission, uh, Anup Singh. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I really uh, appreciate that. Well, let me just interrupt one second to say that uh, yeah. both you, Shankar, and Anup, uh, don't hesitate to put some hard questions to NK, which I'll ask him to respond to. Okay, well... <clears throat> Uh, N.K. note that, huh? that uh, I'm being invited to be tough. <laughs> uh, okay, um, well, I, first of all, um, N.K., uh, I must thank you for, uh, and, and, you know, for uh, writing a wonderful report. Um, uh, it is real education for me, and uh, to some extent also a reminder to eight or nine years back when I... Uh, served as a member of the 12th Finance Commission, headed by our good friend, Dr. Rangarajan. Um, but I want to also emphasize for all those who are viewing, uh, you know, having been a little bit on the inside of finance commissions a long time ago, that uh, I think your commission, NK and Anu and others, uh, you had a specially daunting task. Uh, in, in, in doing this, uh, uh, NK mentioned this, but I want to really say that, that that's absolutely true. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, if you recall, I mean, uh, uh, you know, even before COVID struck, COVID plus lockdown, I think, uh, the economy was suddenly slowing rather uh, sharply between 2017 end and 2019 end. And I mean, I won't go over the numbers, but that's well known. And I think that uh, created very difficult situation for the ongoing finance commission's work because uh, you know you get these uh, projections from the center and states of what their finances are going to be like uh, looking five years ahead. But as NK knows, uh, if uh, in the meantime, the entire growth trajectory of the economy has changed rather dramatically, uh, then uh, what has come to you from the governments con constituting the federation or the union rather, uh, is not that meaningful as it should be. So I think that, that was a very daunting challenge. And of course, COVID complicated matters hugely in terms of the impact on the economy. So I think that uh, I have to give huge credit to you and Kay and Anup and others on the commission for having risen to the challenge of, uh, of, of these special uh, 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 hurdles that you had to contend with. Now, turning to, uh, uh, let me also say that that, uh, uh, that uh, tour d'horizon you just gave NK was, was really tremendous, especially for uh, an, um, someone who's not necessarily schooled in fiscal federalism in the Indian context. It was really a marvelous uh, kind of uh, uh, educative uh, talk. Um, turning to the questions, Rakesh, that you put to me, uh, uh, and they are sort of, in a sense, a little bit of cherry picking there. I'm not trying to cover the whole report in case, so you have to forgive me for that. Um, this issue of the, um, uh, the, what's happened by way of the tax devolution ratio, as NK pointed out, that initially for many years rather, uh, it used to be increased, uh, you know, or let's say ever since, I think it was the 10th Finance Commission, which made it all shareable taxes or the big ones shareable by the same percentage. And since then, every successive uh, uh, commission, including ours of the 12th, uh, changed it by one or two percentage points max. And that brought it up, I think at the end of the 12th commission to about 32% if memory serves me right. 
Um, but then, uh, or, or, or not uh, not twelfth, but uh, by the by the thirteenth, it came to about thirty two percent. And then from thirty two, <clears throat> it jumped to forty two because of the award of the fourteenth Finance Commission. Uh, there were, I mean, I think uh, the chairman of that commission too is a personal friend. I don't want to now say that what he did was wrong or anything. It's just that I think it it kind of, uh, particularly with the benefit of hindsight, it complicated the the tax system set of issues enormously uh, in the following sense, that when you suddenly change the devolution percentage by 10 percentage points from 32 to 42, the central government is faced with an enormous challenge of how to kind of manage its business uh, with after giving that order of increase in devolution. And as those of us who spent time, like NK myself uh, and you and uh, uh, Rakesh in central government for a long time, including the, especially the finance ministry, um, the natural response of the government, predictable I would say in a way, was a huge swing in favor of revenue instruments which were not shareable under the, con uh, under the constitutional formula. So that I think if you look at the trend uh, by any ratio, what happened to the revenue from cesses and surcharges, which are not shareable under our for uh, constitutional formula to any you know, aggregate, whether gross tax revenue or, or uh, gross revenues, current revenues or GDP or whatever, that shot up in the last five years. Uh, please correct me, NK, if I'm wrong, but I think you have a, a table uh, somewhere in the main volume which points this out very clearly. It's not that it hadn't increased earlier, but it didn't ever increase by the kinds of amounts that we saw between, what was it, 2014 and 2019, 20 or thereabouts. And I think that this had two consequences in my view, which were perhaps not desirable. One, it, you know, governments chose instruments which were not necessarily the right instruments for taxation. In other words, cesses and surcharges were often distortive. I mean, take just one example. I, I, I don't want to go through a whole lot. That uh, in the, in the, in the uh, uh, personal and corporate income tax things, take the personal income tax, we, we talk, talk about there being three slabs. But every time you put on a surcharge, essentially you get another slab. And that's what's happened over time. And it's happened in spades, I, I would argue, in the, last, uh, in the last five years because of this challenge that was posed to the central government by that jump in the tax devolution. And I think this has cre essentially created distortions, which I think are not uh, uh, good for the whole system. And uh, I mean, my question, you asked me to uh, ask a hard question to NK. Well, my hard question to NK is, is there a viable solution given our constitution, given our uh, various other non-constitutional traditions and so on, and given the, the legitimate needs of the center and the states. In other words, uh, in your commission's recommendations, uh, you have clearly, as you said, for reasons of stability, not chosen to say reverse part of that 10 percentage point increase at all, other than the 1% for the organization of Kashmir. In other words, 42 equals 41 and it stays there, uh, if I understand it correctly. Uh, Theoretically, uh, you had, uh, your commission had uh, the, uh, if you like, uh, possibility theoretically of going down to, I don't know, 36, 38% and say that, look, you've tried the other thing. It creates its own problems of these uh, cesses and surcharges shooting up, distorting and so on and so forth. Let's just do it the way we used to do uh, or, or, or rather a little less of the devolution ratio and so forth. I fully empathize with the view which says, look, in a COVID year where the states are being hit so hard, and since they are the frontline spenders of our system, to do this is probably politically unthinkable. So I am, you know, I'm not, 
saying that it could have been done this year. But I think the problem remains. And so looking ahead, my question to NK is, okay, you, the 15th Finance Commission was in a particular point in time and it couldn't do this sort of thing. But how else do we solve what I think is a genuine problem in the future? So let me, that's my, my first sort of uh, point and question. Second, as I mentioned, um, um, well, I haven't mentioned that as, as, as NK pointed out, one of the things that uh, this commission has done is that uh, it gives a lot of weight to, in its discussion, analysis, and so forth, to the reform of the GST. And we have to remember, this is the first finance commission after the GST. GST did not exist in the, uh, in the previous 14 finance commissions. Uh, I, I, think he, I think this commission is entirely right in you know, kind of saying the kinds of things it has said because uh, I think it's absolutely necessary to make the GST much more productive without being more distortive in the years ahead for two different sets of reasons. One, that, uh, uh, that the, tax, uh, revenue, the tax to GDP ratio, both for the center and the states is well below what it ought to be. And I think one of the reasons, not all, there are many other reasons, but one of the reasons is that the GST in the way that it was finally implemented in 2017, in terms of the rate structure, in terms of the exemptions and various other practicalities, uh, did not turn out to be revenue neutral in terms of the uh, center and state taxes it replaced or subsumed, if you like. That's my understanding. And I think that's brought out by the numbers in, 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 in uh, the commission's report as well. So that it compounded what was perhaps already a problem of the tax ratio not being high enough from a macro perspective for a country at India's stage of development. Secondly, I think there was a special problem from the point of view of federal fiscal relations, which arose because of this weakness or set of weaknesses of the GST, which is that in subsuming the taxes of the center and states into the GST or replacing them, whatever is the correct word, uh, the states lost their most productive tax, which in the earlier days used to be called the sales tax and then became called the state VAT. So all the sort of uh, uh, kind of lecturing that one does from the central perspective of, look, improve your own revenues performance. Uh, however, uh, how shall I say, unpleasant it was for states to hear it prior to 2017 was I think kind of uh, rubbing salt in the wound after 2017, because they had given up as part of a compact, if you like, their most productive tax on the presumption, presumably, that the GST Council, in its wisdom, would run it in a productive way for the benefit of both center and states when it came to the revenue yield, as well as the economic consequences. Uh, my view would be it hasn't run like that, uh, unfortunately. And therefore, uh, as I would wholly support the Finance Commission's, this Finance Commission's uh, analysis and and recommendations for uh, early and thorough relook and reform of the GST structure, and it's uh, in not just broadly but in its details to solve what I see are so two related but separate problems. Uh, Shankar, just a couple of minutes more, if you. If sure. I... Okay, Qu very quickly uh, on the third point that you asked me, I think, which is uh, on the uh, local government transfers. Uh, uh, I think all the, pretty much all, all the transfers uh, that I could see have gone up, not just in absolute terms, but as ratios. Uh, and my view is particularly on the local government, uh, I welcome that. I also note the high degree of conditionality, uh, which normally one doesn't necessarily like, but I think the institutional changes they're being traded off for in the sense of say, uh, each state having to do the state finance commission report as well as some other uh, kind of presenting accounts properly and all that sort of stuff is worth buying in a, if you like, in a holistic way. 
in terms of uh, the asking for more conditionality in return for for, for more uh, transfer, which is what roughly something like what we did in the 12th Finance Commission, when we also gave higher transfers in return for states doing, uh, we gave them in not transfers, we wrote off debt. Uh, I mean, the recommendation was write off lots of state debt in return for each state having to prepare its uh, prepare and pass its uh, uh, respective FRBM Act. Uh, one last point on uh, um, uh, uh, expenditure transfers uh, recommended by this uh, commission. I have to confess that I have some uh, discomfort with the ones, uh, NK, that you and colleagues have proposed for sector-specific and state-specific ones, uh, because from, my, from sort of my perspective, I think uh, they're perhaps a little too intrusive and micromanagerial, but that's perhaps a personal view, and uh, obviously you didn't, uh, didn't share it. Uh, last sentence, fiscal architecture, wonderful stuff said in there, and I just hope somebody's listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shankar, for those usual um, balanced yet trenchant remarks. Um, and I hope NK has noted your question, which we'll come back to uh, after Anup. So Anup, uh, let me now request you to make your intervention. Um, so, uh, you got a perfect segue with, uh, with 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 Shankar ending with the fiscal architecture issue, which NK also referred to in terms of fiscal uh, institutions. So I would like to ask you to call on your long IMF uh, experience with so many other countries. Uh, in terms, of what have other countries done uh, in building the such um, sort of pillars in some sense or institutions uh, related to fiscal architecture? Um, and um, it would be great, I think, if you, if, if you illustrate uh, from other countries, perhaps comparable countries, and where India stands in comparison. And uh, what are the priority areas where we act, need to act on, this, on these pillars of fiscal uh, architecture? And of course, I would add, how feasible would it be to implement the suggestions that you have? And if, uh, if I can just add one more thing to, in some sense, how you answer this that uh, were you, uh, if, if God forbid, we were actually going to the IMF in these current circumstances and you were putting conditionality on us on our fiscal activities, what would you have said? Okay. Okay, thank you. And uh, I enjoyed hearing the post NK and I'm not going to raise questions for him. And um, I will talk a bit on the fiscal architecture. Um, Shankar made the short point, is anybody listening? So let me just make a very few points, uh, leaving you with some thoughts for the future. Now, looking back in time, when I joined the Finance Commission, as NK asked me to do it, in my early meeting, I asked him a very naive question. I asked NK, uh, is there a revenue commission or are we going to be a revenue commission? So he said, of course not. Uh, don't you know there is a GSC council? So my thought was, if India does not have a revenue commission or something of that sort, given where our tax revenues are, as we've spoken about that, how can the finance commission do its work? Now, that's where India is in terms of its tax ratio. I frankly am not surprised that the center wants to impose assessments and surcharges. I am the last person to defend it. But with a tax ratio of the general government remaining around 17% of GDP for the last 20 years, it is impossible to handle it. If the center has a right to raise assessments, they will do so. The other part of it is spending, expenditures. Uh, it makes even more important the quality and the efficiency of spending. If you haven't got the revenues, what do you spend on? It's very interesting and important. People haven't really focused on this. In the terms of reference that we got, we were asked to look at ways to improve the quality of public spending and look at the equity, efficiency, and transparency of public spending. This is even more critical when our revenues are as they are. Now, my next point is, 
the world is in a different state right now because of the pandemic. Whether we do or do not have a fiscal architecture of the kind that we should have had, I think is now not that important. What is more important is where are we going in the next five years? Even if we had had a fiscal architecture and the pillars, which we have not had beyond the FRBM, which NK was responsible for, we haven't gone beyond that, it would have to be redone now. Almost all major countries are now relooking at their fiscal architecture. The fact that we haven't had one in some ways is helpful. We can now start to look at the next five years. I would say in my perspective of India's public finances, I'll make two points. It's not so much what our debt ratio will be five years from now. Of course, it's important. What is more important is the architecture that underlies it and whether there are distortions in numbers, which mean you can't believe the numbers you have on spending and financing. What do I mean? I would say one of the most important events that have taken place recently is what the finance minister did in her budget. She openly brought online on the budget of budget accounts. And I think she kind of, I say kind of, I think she kind of said, at least for food and certain subsidies, it will not happen again. It means that our deficit is not 3.5 or 4 or 3.6 or 4.3, it's actually nine. And it's because, partly because, a lot of off budget financing were responsible for spending not recognized. I think that is the first very important step forward to make that permanent for all spending. It's not just the financing of spending, it's also what you spend on. If I was a ratings agency person, I'd be equally in interested, even more interested, in what you're spending on. Now, what the Finance Commission's report has brought out periodically, systematically, and volume four, is the nature of what is called committed spending of the center and even more by the states. Committed spending is what is used rightly, I presume, to justify what the commission has done for this revenue deficit grants. That committed spending is not building human capital. It's not capital expenditure. It's committed spending on interest and wages and pensions and things of that sort. So I would say any country needs an architecture that looks at the efficiency and the transparency of what is happening. I think an important step forward has been taken by the finance minister. It's been done for certain categories of spending. I presume it will be done for all. Secondly, it equally matters for expenditures. What I mean is, are there capital expenditures taking place and which are registered as capital expenditures, but which are not. They're making up for operating losses of the past, such as for railways. But even more important in the center are all the states of India. So I would say any country would need pillars of architecture not just institutions such as we need, as NK said, the Fiscal Council, but rules on public financial management. So when you see an aggregate, you know what it is and what it defines. My final point is India has come a long way in its international financial standards. The RBI, like most central banks in the world, have committed to certain standards of financial stability. They are not going to change the number for the 
in the fiction target without telling you. They're not going to tell you the number for WPI if it's a CPI. They have a pretty set internationally accepted set of financial standards. In any country, the government and the central bank have to work together. For the RBI to do its job, they need to know exactly what are the fiscal impulse, the fiscal stance of the general government of India, not just central government. Therefore, what I'm seeing is the architecture needs to move forward. It needs to include the states. The process is very complicated because taking it forward means you need to have a process whereby all the stakeholders are going to be involved in looking at what kind of public financial architecture India needs. And I think we have to make use of the pandemic, recognizing many countries are doing this now. And this is the time for us to do it in the next one to two years. So those are my only comments at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anoop, uh, for those very, again, uh, um, bringing some international perspective and also um, a view on the fiscal architecture that is in some sense realistic and bringing out some of the very key issues that are governing our fiscal situation to do with committed expenditures, etc. And I will just add in that context that um, I must say that I was somewhat take, I've been somewhat taken aback, uh, which I hadn't quite followed so closely, that um, interest payments now account for something like 45% of tax revenues. And so one of my questions there actually, uh, NK, for any of you is that uh, one of the things that the FC has recommended is the continuation of the public debt to GDP ratio as the or government debt to GDP ratio as the anchor for the medium term fiscal uh, consolidations or stability. Now, uh, one thing that's happening uh, in the advanced economies in particular is that because of the extended very low interest rates, that issue is being re-examined. Uh, so in a, in a sense, uh, people are saying, and particularly in the light of COVID expenditures that are being done and, and, and increased public deficits, um, that you can actually go with a higher debt to GDP ratio. And the question in some sense is, that in that context, A, um, uh, will our interest rates also remain lower than before? Therefore, we can do something similar. And B, isn't interest payment to uh, tax revenue a good metric for uh, as an anchor for, 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 for medium term fiscal stability? But um, and okay, let me just give you the floor for maybe uh, five or seven minutes uh, to, uh, to respond to anything you might like from Shankar's and Roop's comments. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, since uh, I'm now speaking uh, immediately after Shankar and Anup has spoken, uh, thanks uh, Shankar for those uh, very generous words about uh, the 15th uh, Finance Commission, which coming from a keen analytical person of your domain knowledge is uh, indeed uh, very, very heartwarming and, and welcome. Uh, Shankar, you have made uh, some important points, uh, some impossible ones to address. Uh, the first one on uh, the issue of uh, what were the options available that uh, while looking at the fact that that cess and surcharge is something which is staring at our face could we in recognition of the inevitable reality that uh, if a lot of the fiscal space of the central government had been foreclosed by the uh, increase from 32 or 31 32.5 percent you are absolutely right uh, to, uh, to 41 42 uh, recognizing that the central government was therefore provoked into increasing the incidence of cess and surcharge and that if we had therefore chosen to shave it down in the area of let us say, to 38, which is the which would also have been huge quantum change from what it was uh, 
uh, uh, would that have led to a decrease in the incidence of uh, cess and surcharge? To some extent, this is a very hypothetical question and um, difficult to understand. But we had to take note of the fact that as the constitutional provision existed, there was no guarantee that in whatever manner we would have recalibrated it down, there was any guarantee that the cess and surcharge would have been recalibrated in a downward direction. Where Shankar, you're absolutely dead right on the numbers and the target is debt is that cess and surcharge in 2011, 10 11, was 10.4% of the GTR. It increased dramatically to 19.9% in the BE of 2021. So in that 10 year period, it's virtually a doubling from 10.4 to close to 20. Of course, to some extent, the 20 is a bit of an optics because uh, embedded in this is about three percentage point, which goes by way of compensation says, uh, GST compensation says, whose gains are entirely uh, available to the state. So if you recalibrate it for that number and that will come to an end in July 21 of this year, when the five-year guaranteed 14% comes to an end. Um, the cess might stay for longer because of the legacy debt, but that's a, that's a separate issue. So even if you uh, take a neutralization on account of the compensation cess, the 10.4 would have gone up to in the region of about 16, 16.5, which is a very, very substantial increase. So one alternative, which I toyed with, I, and I found it very unpractical, is whether I could make the 41 contingent on some frozen number on debt and surcharge, that in case the debt and surcharge exceeds this, this 41 would then subsequently go up to 42 or 43. However, if you do choose to reduce the cess and surcharge, this 41 in some year could come down to 38 or 39. I did toy with the possibility of not one absolute number for the full five year, but variable numbers made conditional. Uh, having considered the options, I found it rather complicated to be able to uh, proceed on that trajectory. And alas, had to feel that in the interest of transparency and greater clarity, not creating more and more uh, uncertainties for the states uh, to leave it uh, as, as I did. But as you rightly point out, what are the viable solutions forward? Now, one interesting point solution that uh, Chakravarti Rangarajan, uh, uh, when he wrote in the piece on the Hindu, on the Finance Commission's recommendations, he said uh, 41, 42 is just right. But you should have a condition that the cess and surcharge should not exceed an X proportion of foreclosing the GTR. And that the current one, if recalibrated uh, on account of the uh, GST compensation cess, which will get phased out, so 16, should not exceed an X. And that this could then be a frozen number. Uh, and made contingent in some way in relation to debt and surcharge being a certain fixed proportion of the uh, gross uh, of the gross tax receipts. I don't know. We toyed with all this, but you have asked a very pointed question towards the end of your: What are the viable solutions? And you use the word viable solution. Well, I see no viable solution except a constitutional amendment that in the 80th constitutional amendment, which enlarged the ingredients of the divisible pool, took off cess and surcharge from being reckoned toward that divisible pool. If that constitutional amendment was introduced to 
to recognize session surcharge or some proportion of the session surcharge above a certain point to be part of the divisible pool, it would certainly allow greater flexibility to successive finance commissions subsequently to be able to calibrate uh, the framework and the rules of the thing. Short of that, constitutional amendment, anything else that we do would be a subterfuge. It shouldn't be, after all, Shankar, a cat and mouse game that every finance commission raises the devolution number and is then neutralized uh, simultaneously by an increase in the cess and surcharge, leaving the states where they were, nor the opposite way. I think, frankly, fiscal federalism needs uh, greater continuity and must be embedded in greater trust. And that this is one of the touchstones, the behavior of this, which will be a touchstone for a continuation or, a, or a reinforcing of the broad parameters of continued federal trust. Stop there on your first point. On your GST, thanks for saying all those things. Uh, and thanks for suggesting uh, that uh, we must aim at what it was conceived of. You were part of the whole process, Shankar, if you remember the 1991 uh, performance criteria, quarterly performance criteria, and the structural reform benchmarks. I was looking at some of the old notes in a different context. And I found that uh, they did talk about a deep rationalization of the excise structure and looking at different states having different excise rates and whether we could move to it. So in some sense, uh, it was a concept which was, uh, uh, which was uh, ingrained at that time. And then subsequently, I don't know, just to tickle your memory, Shankar, when uh, as revenue secretary, I did try to suggest what uh, so that revenue neutral rate could be. At that time, it was working out to be in the ballpark of around 15% or so of what the revenue neutral rate can be. I don't want to enter into a debate of uh, what is today the revenue neutral rate. But yes, certainly we must move towards the drawing board, or redrawing the architecture of the GST beyond procedurals and process changes and others. Uh, some of which have been done, and you see some of the benefits. But the question is, who will and how will this be done? Obviously, we have to leave it to the GST Council. I am uh, very, very enthused to see that the initial reactions of the Ministry of Finance when the Finance Commission's recommendations on some of these have evoked a very positive response. I'm equally enthused to see that they propose that the GST Council should take up some of these issues uh, at their next meeting or at a very early meeting. And I think therefore we need to uh, keep the public awareness alive that we want to really make the GST what it was intended to be, uh, a win-win game for all stakeholders, for consumers by way of simplicity, and predictability on tax rates by way of states in being able to receive uh, uh, much higher. Uh, some of the states, of course, became part of the GST because they genuinely believed that uh, revenues would increase uh, significantly, or the central government who believed that uh, if the GST was, uh, was implemented, as far as revenues are concerned on the indirect tax front, they would be a huge net gainer. So we need to move towards, and these do not necessarily mean increase in the rates, but they certainly mean that you need to recalibrate them, you need to move towards a much fewer rate structure, even if one rate is uh, perhaps uh, too much of an ideal, but certainly I think the broad banding of this uh, is necessary apart from some of the other things like doing away some obvious things like uh, um, inverted uh, duty structure and so on. So I I'm fully with you on that. On the last one, uh, which you mentioned, uh, Shankar, on uh, local government and in terms of, I'm, I'm grateful that you found that some of the conditions which you have put uh, by way of, uh, let us say, um, audited accounts uh, and by way of rejuvenation and greater predictability on state finance commissions uh, have found uh, full endorsement by you. This is exactly what we have recommended. And of course, one component which we have that recognizing exactly, Shankar, what you said, that many of the obvious sources of revenue 
had been taken away from the third tier, making them therefore hopelessly dependent on the state government, which mitigates against their independence, the basic spirit of the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment, uh, find new creative ways of revenue. That is why we did devote a lot of attention to the need to have uh, some methodology on property tax and some methodology on the fixation of property tax and some way in which this can be indexed at least to the state uh, GDP growth, uh, something which on which we had divergent opinions. But that is something which we have also done. And in regard to the others, they are all, for instance, consistent with the important national priorities. Um, we have for the first time done something, uh, I don't know, Shankar, if you noticed that recognizing and drawing lessons from the pandemic, this is for the first time that we have made a grant which was accepted uh, by, the, by, the, by the government, the 8,000 crores for incubation of new cities as part. I recognize that unless new cities, hardly new cities have come up in India, only old cities have got more and more congested. And it takes a pandemic like that to remind that dispersal of people is necessary. Uh, both in terms of better air quality and in terms of better life quality and dealing with away from the sort of infectious things which happen in a pandemic. So that's also what you have done and not the other priority. Your last issue on um, state specific uh, and sector specific. Uh, well, I think that uh, uh, the jury is open, but let me put it Shankar uh, another way to you. Uh, if you look at the totality of the picture, if what is left by way of the divisible pool was shrunk from 135.4 lakh crores from the GTR to only 103 lakh crores, and if what 41% was going to give them 42 lakh crores, then we felt that in order to maintain looking at the rising incidence, of cess and surcharge, which was something staring at us on our face and we could not ignore that. We gave a 10 lakh crore or little above by way of grants of which 4.22 lakh crores, Shankar, went to the third tier. 2.95 lakh crores went to by way of RDG, revenue deficit grant, because we found there that uh, in spite of the demographic performance being made a criteria in the horizontal devolution, some of the states continued to have a huge, uh, huge problem in terms of meeting inescapable expenditure by way of the norms which we had fixed. And so 2.95 lakh crores, as you can see, uh, some of the states which have benefited are not the obvious ones look, which look to be rather uh, backward in terms of per capita income criteria like it's Kerala, uh, it's Andhra Pradesh, uh, it's some of the other states of, of that kind, and some states which had legacy problems. Then you add to that the 4.2, the 2.9, the disaster management. What is really left by way of state specific and by way of sector specific is a small amount. On the, on the sector specific, it was addressing some important terms of reference. So if you look at the big number on the sector specific, the bulk of it, uh, which we have recommended, is for a continuation of the agricultural reforms, incentivizing states, which will get their property records and track, which will move towards a crop diversification, which will economize on the use of water, which will improve the quality of the crops in terms of higher protein yielding, discourage, encourage, encourage the use of agro and agro ex experts, exports uh, outside, and discourage the imports of some of the stuff which can be grown in India, like pulses and oil seeds and so on and so forth. And so a large proportion of that has gone on that, uh, 45,000 crore. 30,000 crore went to something which we felt was necessary, namely to the health sector by way of incentivizing. So add the two together, that's the bulk of it out of that, what has gone to the states. Uh, anyway, I should mention that uh, what we gave to the third tier 70,000 crores out of that, we have earmarked for the health sector, which is primary health centers, district hospitals, municipalities, infectious diseases ward, 
laboratory testing and so on. And this 30,000 crore, which we had suggested was an add-on. Now, none of this has been rejected, but what uh, I believe is being done is to subsume them in larger centrally sponsored scheme analysis, which is currently uh, underway. I'll stop there on the, uh, your comment on the sector and state specific and turn for a minute to Anoop's, uh, Anoop's uh, in some important points. Um, Thank you for me. Okay, before you start, the, let me just put uh, the two, three questions that come from the audience, then you can answer both Anoop and, and those together. Sure, uh, whatever. Before, before the time gets over, if you don't mind. No, oh, I see. Okay, fine. So just uh, just two, three questions, a few questions have come up. One actually you've already answered. It's from a former colleague, Jagbon Bajaj, um, uh, where uh, he said uh, that he, he basically said that his chairman is right in saying that sharing cesses requ require constitutional amendment. Uh, but then he adds that an advisory on the subject may have been helpful. Uh, so that's more like a comment, uh, more than a question. But, but thanks, thanks, thing. thanks, Jagmohan, for sparing your time. It's always a pleasure to have you in any such. Who knows about many of these things better than you, Jack Mohan? I'm a huge admirer of yours. Okay. And then there's another from another friend, uh, Raju Rajvardhan Kanoria. Um, there's the old chestnut that we talk about low tax GDP ratio, uh, basically asks, uh, raising the issue that is there a strong, he believes there's a strong case to bring agricultural income above a threshold into the tax net and giving really very really high threshold actually, one crore per, per annum. So the question is A, whether it's feasible, I would, I'm adding that question, and B, uh, would, that make, would that make much of a difference to the tax uh, GDP ratio? Uh, and then we have another question from, <coughs> from Admiral Girish Lutra, um, that uh, <coughs> and he says that this was under the discussion of the 14th Finance Commission. Uh, can there be anything the Finance Commission could do in terms of the quality of expenditure and resource allocation to limit <laughs> expenditure by states on populist uh, schemes. And finally, one, uh, uh, another panelist who is not, uh, other attendees not give his name, uh, considering the move towards the presidential mode of governance that you mentioned, NK, uh, from the Westminster system, is this for the better? Well, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, so let me first for us to address Anup's question, then, but I thought I'd just put them in so that you can give your final comments. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, we'll, uh, you'd like to give me five minutes. Yeah, to absolutely. It. Sure. sure. We. So first, I think Anup, uh, uh, we were together. You speak the same language. Uh, the last chapter uh, in the Commission's report addresses in many ways the issues which uh, uh, we have, you have mentioned, Anoop. Uh, exactly. On, uh, the, what do we do in terms of uh, uh, the overall framework of uh, uh, rules of public uh, financial management system? And uh, we have all mentioned this together. We have signed off together. Hopefully, uh, this will receive in the fullness of time and I'm using the word fullness of times because both of us discounted that in the current uh, scenario of, of grappling with the pandemic, it's unlikely to receive uh, uh, too much public force, fo focus. But of course, we are talking in terms of a medium term uh, horizon and therefore, yes, Anoop, I, I, I agree with you. I also agree with you that uh, when we talk of general government, uh, we need to talk of both the center and the states. It is much easier for the for the central government to enact a, a framework, but it needs to be applicable to and acceptable to the states. Right. Acceptable because accepting for the uh, crude instrument of 293.3, there's nothing else. No other instrument exists which can compel them uh, to be able to do so. And if, even about this 293.3, I did mention in my overarching comments the, the fact of a lack of symmetry in the way in which the fiscal rules apply both to the center and the states. Uh, so I will stop there, uh, Anoop, except to say that uh, you have uh, someone who fully agrees with you. And we are both together when we signed off uh, on this report. Uh, to Jagmohan's question, um, Jagmohan, uh, as I mentioned to you that, thank you for re-reminding us that if uh, uh, 
the issue of cess and surcharge was to be addressed, it requires basically a constitutional amendment. Now you do mention, uh, Jagmohan, that could we have done something else? So then it question uh, came to writing a good poetry on this issue. Uh, you are aware that the 13th Finance Commission had done that. Uh, the 14th Finance Commission had also done that. We have written bits of poetry. If you read paragraph 3.63, paragraph 3.8, paragraph 4.25, paragraph 4.26, these are forms of poetry in which you recognize the fact of this cess and surcharge uh, increasingly becoming a much higher and higher proportion of the uh, proportion of the GTR. And also we did uh, one, one better. Uh, we did one better in the sense that uh, we have frozen in the permissible numbers at 18.4 for the full award period uh, shaving it in a downward direction from around 20%, which exists now. And we recognize that out of this, of course, three percentage points and a half will go away after 21 when the, uh, the, four, the guaranteed period uh, comes to an end. Of course, by the way, on this guaranteed period coming to an end, I should have really, Rakesh commented, and allow me to do so now, that perhaps as a grand bargain, when states accepted the constitutional amendment and were actively partnering it, the fact of a guaranteed revenue of a 14% rate of return, irrespective of what happens, was it not an onerous responsibility? Of course, when the economy does well, uh, the compensation says is overflowing, it's much easier to discharge these obligations. But then things look a little more tricky and the 14% is written as a stone, uh, we had the problem of how the whole issue of compensation says was going to be calibrated in the period of our entire period of our award. We have, of course, assumed that this comes to an end in, in July, but we have taken that the past legacy did, which the central government has in no way uh, retracted or in any way sought to wriggle out the cess will be continued in such time as this liability is not fully extinguished, the past liability is not fully extinguished. We have therefore reckoned for the extinction of this past liability by taking this as part of the state's anticipated revenue during the period of our award. Um, Mr. Kanoria's question on agriculture income tax, we looked at various things. It is entirely in the domain of the states. It is for the states to take a view because uh, agricultural income tax under the constitution is subject which is agricultural income is a subject of the states. And therefore incidence of agricultural income tax is something that uh, uh, they would want that. There's nothing to prevent them, but they would have to take a view. On the general question of uh, Admiral Ruth Luthra on uh, much better and vastly more improved monitoring on expenditure outcomes. By the way, uh, I thought that General Lutra would have, uh, Admiral Lutra would have commented on the unusual recommendations which you have made on the defense sector, uh, which I thought I will mention. The fact that uh, not only we made it, but for the first time, the central government uh, accepted in principle the creation of a non-lapsable fund for defense. And uh, this is to bridge the asymmetry in the finance cycle and the procurement cycle. Now that I think, but of course, on the, we have given a model for financing. The central government would like to consider that model for financing. But I think that the long pending demand of the defense forces for a non-lapsable fund has found an acceptance. On the expenditure outlay, and this is something that goes back to what Anup said. Do we need a permanent expenditure commission? Do we need a permanent finance commission? Part of the asymmetry arises that the GST council is in perpetuity. The finance commission is not in perpetuity. The ability therefore to recalibrate the entire issues of devolution to states based on expenditure outcomes. And I'm here thinking of the Australian example 
Australia has a permanent grants commission. Australia has also a permanent expenditure commission, which calibrates the grants based on expenditure outcomes at the end of each fiscal year. Other countries like South, South, uh, South Africa has also a permanent finance commission. We are a unique country which, uh, in which uh, under Article 280, this is a commission which uh, is to be set up by the president every five years. That's all that it says and is silent on the rest. Of course, it lays down what this commission is supposed to do, but uh, we need to rethink and go back to the drawing board that based on best international practices and example, what kind of a long time, long term framework on fiscal finances would be appropriate. And this will include not only on the working of finance commission, on expenditure commission, on fiscal roadmap, particularly if you are asked to make predictions and projections for a period of five years. And thank you, Shankar, for reminding, and thanks, Rakesh, for reminding us on the onerous duties of this commission. Some point in time, I almost thought with my colleagues sharing the view that we would need to believe not only in, in economic modeling, but more than a touch of abilities to be an astrologer on how the numbers were likely to behave over a period of five years or so, looking at current uncertainties, both uh, India and uncertainties globally. And that under in these volatile uncertain times, to make a prediction and a projection in the award uh, was indeed truly, truly very, very problematic. We have we had no option, we had bitten the bullet, the likelihood proved wrong, and the consequences of proving wrong are going to be rather troublesome. That is why it brings me back to what I said. The inability of the Indian constitution to provide a recourse mechanism for any midterm correction is a serious infirmity in the scheme of things. Because if we go horribly wrong, which is possible, uh, we may go horribly right, which is also possible, uh, which we, we acclaim that. But in either way, there is no recourse which the constitution provides. And that is why we need to, you know, Admiral Luthra, think ahead in terms of what kind of a framework of policy would be appropriate for the kind of economy and the kind of uncertainties would lie ahead and the kind of prospects for a higher growth trajectory of which we must all optimistically uh, join and we must optimistically reinforce. Thank you very much, Rakesh. Thank you, thank you very much indeed, NK. On a lighter note, what makes you think that economists are that different from astrologers as far as forecasting is uh, concerned? Uh, so you, I think you had a good uh, set of uh, astrologers with you in the commission. Um, it just remains for me to thank uh, you, NK, first of all, for giving us a real lesson in public policy making. Um, giving us first a very broad view based on the constitution and in some sense educating us on the many constitutional features that we have that govern our fiscal system and within which of course the finance commission uh, is part of. Um, and then of course your amazing grasp of detail. Having myself chaired a number of uh, national committees I can tell you that I would not have remembered in detail the kind of detail that you remember from a report, from various reports that I have done if I was in a similar session after committing my reports. So thank you very much indeed for this real lesson and how public policy making is done and how much detail is important in doing what we do. Um, Shankar, uh, thank you for again, uh, really coming to some of the few, very important, pithy, important points that have come out of the Finance Commission report. Of course, there are many, many other issues that could be discussed, but I think uh, NK's response to your, to your issues uh, uh, illustrates how important your questions were. 
and the points that you made. Thank you very much again, Shankar, for giving us your time. Anup, of course, you're you, you're sort of doubly inside in the sense of being a member, having been a member of the Finance Commission and distinguished fellow of CSEP. So I don't have to thank you as much as I did to NK and uh, Shankar, but nonetheless, thank you very much. But actually, thank you for setting up this, these sessions. And to the audience, thank you for being with us. And as I said, uh, two more opportunities, same time, same place, next Monday and the following Monday, 15th and 22nd.